The state superintendent talks teacher training and test scores. Plus, what do lawmakers really think about a part-time legislature? Also coming up, expanding retail in Detroit and new plans for the Detroit Riverfront. It's all coming up on My Week right now. Did you know Gordon Food Service was started by a 23-year-old entrepreneur as a butter and egg delivery business more than a century ago. In 1948, school teacher Gerard Wendell Hayworth borrowed $10,000 from his parents to start a woodworking operation in his family's garage. It's now Hayworth Incorporated. These are just some of the ways Michigan's pioneers started out as small companies with big ideas. We are business leaders for Michigan. We are committed to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Marillat cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Funding for this program is provided by Delta Airlines. Keep climbing. Hi there and welcome to My Week. I'm Christy McDonald. Thanks so much for joining me. I hope that you're enjoying the holiday week with family and friends. That's what Stephen and Nolan are doing. So I thought we'd bring you a bit of a different show tonight. It's a collection of some of my favorite interviews from the Mackinac Policy Conference. We'll start off with an in-depth conversation with the state superintendent, Brian Whiston. Then the Senate Majority Leader and the House Minority Leader say what they really think of the idea of a part-time legislature. Plus, you'll hear about some new plans for the Detroit Riverfront from Conservancy CEO Mark Wallace. And also the new plans for one business owner when she decides to take a chance on retail. I'll introduce you to Rachel Lutz. And we'll wrap it all up with a conversation with the new Detroit Public School Superintendent, Dr. Nikolai Vitti. That is all coming up for you. But we do start with what is going to be the biggest issue to tackle statewide this year, and it is education. Namely, how do we improve dismal test scores and the fact that we've fallen into the lower third nationwide? There's a lot that comes into play. Here's Superintendent Brian Whiston. We're somewhere in the bottom third of states in terms of performance, and we have to really do better. We owe it to our students, our, our taxpayers to do better. So. Where are we starting to see some improvement? We're starting to see improvement in some reading and writing scores, starting to see improvement in terms of multiple pathways for students. Very excited working with the governor on some career tech options for students. We've gone from a handful of programs to more than 100 programs where kids are going to high school and getting college credit, graduating with a, up to a two-year college degree as part of their high school experience. So we're starting to see improvement across the board and really Going to deeper learning in the classroom, you have districts going to competency-based education, which really looks at, let's not talk about what age a kid is or what grade they are, but where are they at academically? Kind of meet them at their level. Yeah, right, and let them progress either slower or faster than what we would say in a traditional sense, and let students drive that, not us. Uh, you know, I want to talk a little bit about teachers and teacher training and, and, of course, curriculum and what is going on in the classroom. But first off, I want to take a look at, at something that you tackled in the last couple of months, and it's the possible closure of schools. So the state reform, the school reform office, they're the ones that say, well, you've been in the bottom for a while. You could be up for a closure of your school. The Department of Education then came in and said, let's work out a deal to see if these schools can stay open. What were some of those plans and what did they entail and what kind of solutions can you start to give these schools or, or benefit? benchmarks to say, gosh, you've got to hit those or else we've got to come up with another solution. It's very excited working with the governor and the state board of education. We came up with what we call a partnership agreement. And in these partnership agreements, school districts have to meet certain standards at 18 months and 36 months. And those standards are different for each school depending on where they're performing at. But their academic goals, their uh, in academic goals in reading, math, writing, those kinds of things. And they have to hit those benchmarks at 18 months or 36 months. And if they don't hit them at 18 months, then we're going to talk to them about the local ISD playing more of a role in the schools and or closure of the schools and reconstitution. Now, the partnership agreement is exciting because what it says is local district, you own the problem, you own your test scores, but we're going to come to the table with a bunch of partners from the business community, from higher education, from nonprofits, boys, girls clubs, all sorts of nonprofits. And we're going to say, 
What are your five to 10 goals that you're going to agree to in this partnership agreement? And what can these different partners bring to the table to help you accomplish these goals? What you see in Detroit and many struggling districts is a lack of focus, where everybody's got an idea on how to fix education, so you're doing 10, 20, 30 things to try to improve education. And we want them to focus with laser focus on five or six things they can do to improve reading and math across the grade levels. And so the partnership deal brings these nonprofits, colleges, businesses to the table to say, we're going to help the school districts reach these goals. But if they don't, we understand that there's going to be a next level of accountability. So I thank the governor for giving us a chance to create these partnership agreements. So when you say a next level of accountability, that would eventually be closure. It could be. It could be in 18 months if a school isn't meeting the standards, we would say you need to close the school. If, if the school needs to be open based on uh, student population location, they could reopen it, but it'd have to be a new school, new staff, new administration, and a new philosophy. So, for example, if it's a high school and it's a traditional high school, they would have to close, but they could open up as an IB school, they could open up as a five-year plan where kids go to high school and college at the same time. Mm -hmm. If it's an elementary, it could be a theme school, a music art school, it could be those kinds of different options. So they obviously have to be measured somewhere at the end of the day. Yes. Is that with the M step? Is, is that the benchmark measurement now? So we're, we're using a couple different benchmarks. A lot of districts use what is these benchmark assessments called either iReady or NWEA, and that shows year to year growth. So I started third grade, where was I at? I ended third grade, where was I at? Did I get that year's worth of growth or more? And in these struggling school districts, we need to see more than a year's worth of growth in the students. So that's one measure, their local NWA or iReady measure. Another measure is the, uh, is the M-STEP test. That's the second measure. And the third one is the ACT assessment. So we're using multiple assessments because we understand students uh, you know, can struggle in taking assessments and we want to be fair, but we want to hold the kids to high standards. Hold the kids to high standards, but in turn that's also holding the teacher to a high standards. Let's right. talk about um, teachers, uh, the, the kind of training that you believe that they're getting right now. Are we training our teachers the best possibly that we can? And are we giving them a chance to succeed and giving them the support they need instead of walking to a classroom with 35 first graders and saying you've got to make sure that all of these kids are able to read at that certain benchmark level by the end of the year. Good luck. Right. Both the the state board's 10 and 10 plan and the governor's 21st Century Education Commission call for changes in how we prepare teachers for success in the classroom. We really need to go to a, a more of a medical model, I like to say, where students in school who want to become teachers learn it in a classroom and then implement it right away instead of going through a class and then implementing it a year or two or three years later. So if they're learning how to teach kids to read, They'd learn that in their college course, and then they're immediately working in a school, helping to input that learning that they, that they got. So, so we're looking at making changes to more of a medical model. Secondly, we want to change so that when they graduate, they're, you know, they're one level of teacher, and they can move up several steps to becoming a master teacher. And those things they would have to accomplish at each level to become that master teacher. And so we do need to make changes how we prepare. We know that we have a, we're heading into a teacher shortage. We have a lot less, about 50% less people going into education as a profession. Why and, do you think that is? Well, I think there's a couple reasons. One, I think education's been under attack for the last decade, so that's one reason. Second reason is pay, because we had a kind of a bad decade and schools had to cut. So there's a lot of school districts are hiring teachers at the 28 to 32,000 range. Why would someone want to graduate with a $100,000 debt and take a job that pays so little? I mean, all my kids were very blessed to go to college and graduate and start jobs in the 50, 60,000. So as people look at careers, I think the battle of the, the education has been under attack. Starting pay of teachers has been an issue. Uh, so I think we have to address and honor that and really bring the honor of once upon a time, a day, being a teacher was an honored profession, and we have to return to that. 
Our thanks to Brian Weston. In early June, Lieutenant Governor Brian Kelly announced an ambitious plan to lead a ballot initiative to have a part-time legislature in Michigan. Now, many thought that big announcement was him running for governor. That hasn't happened yet. But the idea of a part-time legislature not tied into changing term limits has made for a hot debate across the state, and namely with the men and women who hold legislative jobs right now. Even members of Cali's own party aren't thrilled. I had that discussion with Senate Majority Leader Arlen Mikoff and House Minority Leader Sam Singh. I do work part-time now. It's any part of 90 or 100 hours a week that you want. And I think it's incumbent on us to, to show the citizens what it is we do so they, they don't have an appreciation for uh, length of service or experience. Uh, and, and a company, if you're looking for folks, you're really looking for experienced folks that have done some number of things because if, if now if you were to have a knee surgery or replacement, you would want the guy who's done 500 knee replacements, not the guy who came out of med school and just starting out. Uh, experience matters. Uh, and for some reason, it isn't valued in this position. I, I haven't figured out why. So are you talking more about also term limits as well? Yes, I think that that has something to do with it. I mean, we have Senator Knopf, Senator Prose, and others that have worked on public policy or appropriations, and they're, they'll have a, a wealth of experience that can actually then represent the taxpayers much better when they know how the budgets are and how, how they can benefit the taxpayers and use the dollars that, we, that they do send us, use them the most wise way to get the most for the dollar. Representative Singh, what do you think? Should there be a part-time legislature? Well, you know, I was disappointed with how this all actually came to be because it was very clear it was a political gimmick uh, to kick off somebody's gubernatorial campaign. There are part-time legislatures. You could have taken the best of, from across the country, put it into a proposal, and from what I've heard about the proposal, none of those items are actually in there. And if you wanted to have a real conversation, come to the legislature. Let's have that conversation as a team. Uh, but it was very clear that this was really meant to kind of kick off somebody's gubernatorial campaign. He had six and a half years to kind of bring up this proposal. Didn't do it. But two days before he announces his campaign for governor, he does it. So to me, the whole concept wasn't really about good policy for the state of Michigan. It was more about a political gimmick. All right. So how do you change the perception, though, that it seems that people in Michigan have? And the Center for Michigan did a study over this last year about terms of trust in government and what trust that people have or don't have that government and our elected officials can get things done. How do you change the perception, then, about what you are doing in Lansing? Or not I, doing I, I think we, we haven't done a good job telling the story about how Michigan has improved under the current leadership. I mean, if uh, Lieutenant Governor would have acknowledged, hey, this group of people, including Sam and others, have, have done some really difficult work to move, put Michigan in a really, really great spot. And then look at, if you, if you acknowledge that and then say, but in the future we should do something different, and we may, if this proposal is correct, if I understand it correct, we may be the only state that's part-time and term limited. So. In theory, you could have somebody be Speaker of the House after 90 days on the job. It seems a little bit disconcerting it's to most it seems people. It a little like disconcerting that. to some people. Yeah. I mean, so that, that may, maybe go part and parcel with that. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think we should have a conversation, but the legislature is closer to the people. You know, it's not often that somebody calls the governor or gets to meet with the governor and so forth. So the legislature actually is the conduit for the people to actually get their policies and their voices heard to the legislature. So to kind of lessen that power and that ability doesn't make a lot of sense. As the legislature, we've had to hold this governor and this lieutenant governor accountable, whether it was for the Flint water crisis, for the uh, uh, unemployment insurance agency fiasco. That's what our legislative branch is supposed to be doing. And when you kind of lessen that, uh, it doesn't really help the general public, and that's one of the reasons why governors love to talk about part-time legislatures, because they don't want to have the accountability that we can bring to the system. Turning now to the Detroit Riverfront, it is a beautiful time of year to go downtown, walk along the water, and take advantage of some of the changes and the development that the Riverfront Conservancy has worked on, and there is more to come. Here's Mark Wallace. When you think about Detroit, 300 years ago, people were landing at that location. It's in our bones, it's in our DNA, it's in our hearts in a certain way. And the riverfront has really just extended that use and become a really special gathering place where there's, there's no two Detroit story at the riverfront. It's one place and everyone feels welcome. The growth has been really amazing in yeah. the last couple of years. And what I love about it, it's just no longer this one strip. There's so many spokes now that, you're, right. that, you're, that you're working on that that lead people there, that lead people now to other pockets. There's the connection. There's no longer just these pockets. That's and talk right. a little bit about some of the work. Well, we're really excited about that. And, and if you look at it, you know, starting at Cobo Hall and, and uh, Joe Louis Arena, all the way down to GM with a fountain and Rivard Plaza with a carousel, Mount Elliott Park with a water park, and mm -hmm. then the Butterfly Gardens down at Gabriel Richard Park. It's really a series of public spaces. And then when we built it to Quinter Cut and started managing that, 
everyone realized, oh my gosh, it's, it's great to have these non-motorized uh, opportunities to access the riverfront. So the planning exercise we just completed with the Detroit Economic Growth Corporation and the city of Detroit uh, planning department with, with Maurice really allowed us to identify additional opportunities to make those connections. So if you love the DeQuinder Cut, we have two more opportunities that we're going to be building over the next two years, which will be very similar to that type of experience. Old, old train lines and old uh, biking paths that'll take people from those neighborhoods straight to the waterfront. And some of the plans now that we're seeing the, you know, the renderings of having cafes and, ha you know, and, and, and really starting to develop this space along the water right. is, is exciting to say the least. Oh, it is, and it's been a long time coming. Yeah, places are really activated by their neighbors, mm -hmm. and so our idea that building the public space would stimulate economic development is really that second phase. But what we want to do is make sure that economic development is not some suburban spaceship that lands on the riverfront. We want to make sure that it feels like Detroit, it's special like Detroit, and it's something we can be proud of as a city of Detroit. So yeah, it, it really matters for us to curate what comes next. And a big idea that came out of that uh, riverfront planning process is that authentic places are often built off of historic renovation instead of new construction. So the riverfront's pretty unique. It's not like Midtown where there are a lot of old buildings you can bring back online but there are a couple of old buildings. So we think that starting with the old historic character, that neighborhood is really the way to stimulate and improve the quality of what comes in the new, new environment. Because how many times do you get an opportunity to be able to plan like this and <laughs> to don't. have that kind of thoughtful, like what do we want this space to be and That's what right. we want it to look like because for the next 50 years or so, it, it, it's, it's almost heady in terms of saying, gosh, where can we be? That's right. From there. Well, and it's amazing. Our next planning exercise is going to focus on the West River front. And we bought a 22 acre park over there, the old free press site. Mm -hmm. uh, tore down the old free press printing plant and we've opened that up to the public. So it's already starting to be a thing. But that's a really exciting opportunity for us as well. We're going to turn that into a world class park. Mm -hmm. We're very excited about that opportunity. Uh, and it's the sort of thing, I mean, it's a once in a lifetime to be able to build a park for the city that you love, return it to the people and, and know that for hundreds of years, People are going to be coming down there, making memories, uh, staying healthy, interacting with nature. It's really a wonderful opportunity. Our thanks to Mark Wallace. Mark, we'll see you along the water this summer. Well, now I'd like to introduce you to Rachel Lutz. If you've ever had to buy the perfect dress for an event, you may know her. She's the owner of two popular stores in Midtown. One is called the Peacock Room. The other is called Frida. And she took a chance on starting retail in the city when a lot of people told her she was simply nuts. Now she's expanding into the Fisher Building with a new store and challenging the assumptions of shopping habits, development, and entrepreneurship. Take a look. I had no plans for a physical expansion. Um, business has been great at the Peacock Room in Frida. Frida, we actually just doubled the size of the store in anticipation of the queue line opening. Um, and the Fisher Building approached me about a month ago and planted an idea. And I, I said, no at first. I said, no more stores. And then I thought, you know what? How do you say no to the Fisher Building? It is just magnificent architecture. It's the world's largest art object, they call it. Mm -hmm. And I really, really believe in New Center. I believe in the Fisher Building. The developers, uh, the platform, they really have a vision for not just New Center, but Brightmoor, Island View. They're really investing a lot of areas in Detroit that haven't seen a lot of development mm -hmm. on this scale, uh, really during my lifetime. So. How do you say no to that? Yeah, I know. so now you're part of it. So what is the third store going to be like? Is it going to be obviously a little different than what you already have? It, they're all different brands. So the Peacock Room is kind of 20s to 50s Hollywood inspired, very retro, vintage inspired. Frida's more bohemian, more casual, so jeans, leggings, sweaters. Yama is the new store. Yama is named after Yamasaki, my favorite architect, mm -hmm. who left a really big footprint in Detroit. If you know anything about Yamasaki, he was very clean lines, modern. Um, so we're looking at very architecturally inspired uh, retail, mostly women's apparel. You know, I think it's really interesting, and I love your story, and, and you and I have been friends now for a little bit, and, and I've, I'd love to see the growth of, you are the quintessential um, small business owner who came in and took a chance when I'm sure a lot of people said, you're crazy to be <laughs> investing the way you are in that area of Detroit, plus with retail, with small retail that everyone said, nah, everyone's going to order online now. Yeah, people did tell me I was crazy. They said that you shouldn't be doing a business in Detroit, which I thought was the opposite. It was like the best place to open a business. Retail is dying. I think we've proved that wrong. Um, bad retail is dying. And really, I mean, I, I could not have picked a better location at a better time. So, you know, you go in when there's an opportunity there. And I saw opportunity where I think a lot of people just look at Detroit as face value and they, they just 
skim past all the richness that's there, and frankly the market that's there, it's an underserved market. So as chains continue to overlook Detroit at to some point, I think that they're missing a huge opportunity, and I hope that they look at successes like mine as there is a market there, it deserves to be served, and we need to serve it, and we can serve it well, even better than they do out in the suburbs. Have you kind of become a de facto mentor for people who are looking to open small businesses or say, gosh, I'm going to go talk to Rachel because this is how she's done it or gotten mm -hmm. through some of the red tape. Have you found that it's easier for people to come in with small business in mm -hmm. Detroit now? There has not been a lot of red tape for me. I know that the restaurant industry can be very different. Right. Um, but retail, the barrier to entry is really quite low. I started my business maxing out a credit card um, and got created with the financing. It's very humbling that other people come to me for advice. I'm happy to give it because I wouldn't have been able to start my businesses without the amazing support network. The Detroit entrepreneurial scene is just, everybody's so supportive of one another. They really want to see each other succeed. So it was the perfect time for that as well. Like that's the network that helped me launch and that's what I want to help do for other entrepreneurs. Our thanks to Rachel Lutz. And finally tonight, changes are coming for Detroit Public Schools. The new superintendent, Dr. Nikolai Vitti, has been on the job about a month. He's just announced he's keeping on former superintendent Alicia Merriweather, and he's aiming to put master teachers who have been training other teachers back into the classroom. He is candid about the tough job that he has in front of him, and he is especially aware of how he has to help parents and students in the district. Well, I think what our focus is when we're talking about parents is one, making sure that their children are safe in our schools. We can't even talk about education if children aren't safe. Um, so we have to make sure that we continue to do that well um, and consistently. And then secondly, obviously improving the educational quality of what they're receiving as far as children are concerned. So our main focus is on the 46,000 students that are currently in our school system. There's certainly going to be talk about recruiting parents back to our school system, but we have to focus on the 46,000 that are there now and improve the educational experience for those children. I think when we do that, parents will see, hear that, they'll talk to other parents, and we'll be, be able to return parents that have left the system to come back. And then we're, we're going to develop new programming, especially for 1819, that is dynamic and unique for Detroit. And I think that's going to be an opportunity to bring parents back that aren't even thinking about Detroit public schools right now. So when you're talking about those 46,000 children and their experience in the classroom, you're talking about buildings and the, con the con yeah. conditions of those, but you're also talking about teachers, teachers feeling supported, or even having enough teachers to get in those classrooms. Well, that's right. And, and that's why one of the first short-term goals is to be fully staffed or near fully staffed by the fall. Uh, we can't really talk about offering an excellent educational experience if we don't have a full-time teacher in the classroom. So right now we have 100 pure vacancies, 160, vacant, 160 extra vacancies if you include long-term subs. We have to rectify that situation by the fall uh, and function with a sense of urgency around that. I think the first step in, in that direction uh, is, is finalizing the current contract negotiations that we have with our teachers. It will provide a small bump um, for all teachers, uh, but it's not the salary that I think our teachers deserve, but that will happen in the long term, but at least it's a demonstrative um, a strategy to increase salaries for existing teachers and new teachers that are possibly going to come into our school system. And then, as you mentioned, we ought to change culture. Um, so the reality is our district has been functioning in a state of chaos, in a, in a state of crisis um, for some time. And it's really, it's been an approach to survive, not really the ideal scenario when you're talking about culture of an organization. At the end of the day, people don't want to work in an organization that's constantly changing, evolving, new leaders, new governance structures. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I'm excited to work with this new elected board and stay for the long term to create stability um, and, and to be once again a thinking, reflective, visionary organization, not one that's just trying to survive. And I think when we change the culture in that regard, we're going to see teachers stay and we're going to be able to recruit a whole group of teachers that are new to the profession. Uh, you have to feel that sense of urgency though from, from teachers and Absolutely. from parents saying, gosh, we've had failed experiments. And when you're talking about failed experiments on kids and losing the time, how do you balance the urgency of saying, gosh, we have to make some changes and make them pretty darn quickly with the 
this is going to take a little bit of time. Yeah, I, and I think, I think that's just knowing the body of work. And, it, and so I think one thing that the board saw in my candidacy is someone that has led a large urban school district, one that with 130,000 students. Uh, prior to that, I was in Miami-Dade, the fourth largest school district in the country with over 300,000 students. So I think my work has always been about focusing on what matters most, which is what happens in the classroom. And everything in the organization needs to support that directly or indirectly. And you have to be able to identify short-term issues that are immediate, but also plan ahead. Our thanks to Dr. Nikolai Vitti. We'll be watching for more changes before the beginning of the school year. And that is going to do it for my week this week. So glad that you joined me. Make sure you keep up with all of our One Detroit special reports. Just go to myweek.org and you'll find our stories and ones that you might have missed. Plus, we're on Facebook. We are on Twitter at MyWeek. So make sure you say hi. Tell us what's on your mind. For all of us at Detroit Public TV, I'm Christy McDonald. We will see you next Thursday for My Week. Take care. Did you know Roush Enterprises was selected by Google to assemble a test fleet of 100 prototype self-driving cars in 2015. It also produced the new Domino's delivery cars. And speaking of Domino's, Domino's sells well over 2 million pizzas per day around the world and half of their sales are digital. These are just some of the ways Michigan's pioneers started out as small companies with big ideas. We are business leaders for Michigan. We are committed to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Marillat cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Funding for this program is provided by Delta Airlines. Keep climbing.